This is what it looks like to F around and find out. At this point, y'all already know how I feel about chimps. They're chainsaws with thumbs. Chimps will actually commit coordinated and calculated acts of violence. I'm talking premeditated in the first degree. Usually they'll do this against rival troops, but sometimes it'd be their own mans. Chimps often have a dominant alpha male with all the others falling into a hierarchy. This was an alpha male named Pimu. And long story short, Pimu was a bully. He was a tyrant top dog and asserted his dominance by beating on his underlings. But like all bullies, one day Pimu pushed too far. It started with Pimu being groomed by another chimp named Primus. It was all good, until Pimu turned around and bit Primus. Primus had enough and a fight quickly broke out. Soon a bunch of other male chimps got involved and basically they jumped Pimu. Remember, they feared him, but they didn't like him. A couple chimps did try to defend him, but they were quickly chased off, leaving the former leader at the mercy of his troop. And chimps don't have mercy. If you look at people who survive chimp attacks, they have similar injuries, disfigured face, fingers if not entire hands missing, and severe bite wounds. And that's because chimps don't try to murk you, they try to inflict as much pain as possible. And that is exactly what they did. These chimps took turns beating on their former leader, biting at his face and hands. At one point, they even castrated him. The chimps would constantly stop and it would seem for a moment like they'd let Pimu go, until one of them would start screaming and initiate the attack all over again. By the time it was over, the former bully was beaten, battered, and bloodied. He had been mutilated and was missing fingers, toes, and even the equipment you need to make babies. Ultimately, it was a rock to the skull that put him out of his misery. Moral of the story, if there is one, nobody likes bullies. Remember that elephant that traveled 100 miles to turn a woman into a hashtag and then pull up to her funeral to inflict more disrespect on her body? Well, it happened again, except this time we know the reason. Elephants are often used as work animals in places like Thailand. And apparently there's no workers union if you have four legs in a trunk. A 20 year old male elephant named Bump M was being worked in the intense Thailand heat carrying hundreds of pounds of logs. Which I'm pretty sure is illegal now. I don't know if it was the brutal heat or the disrespect of taking orders from something 20 weight classes under it, but the elephant snapped. In more ways than one. Bump M used his tusks to split his handler in half and then stood over his sole divorced corpse for hours. Officials only recovered the body after darting the elephant from 1600 feet away. But by then, the man was well beyond past tense in a pool of his own Kool-Aid. Look, I love elephants, but even I know the heaviest thing on the planet with legs and a pulse isn't something you want to give a reason. Because an elephant not finna file a labor dispute, they're just gonna make sure the next time your family sees you is in a box. And the more elephants get abused, the more people mess around and make the news. You wanna know the really messed up part about this? Like the part that will never sit right with me? What you're looking at right now? Yeah, that's the nerfed version. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Mega Frickin' Lania. Sparknotes version, everything a Komodo is on steroids. Megalania was believed to grow anywhere from 13 to 23 feet long. It was estimated to tip the scales at well over a thousand pounds. Like its Komodo cousin, it would have been armed with a mouthful of serrated steak knives for teeth. And like the Komodo, it would have hunted by inflicting a septic venom filled bite on whatever was on its grocery list. And as an apex predator, that could be anything. Even if you somehow managed to escape the first attack, you'd still likely fall to a slow and painful infection. Not to mention the venom likely contained anticoagulants, which would have nerfed blood clotting, meaning you'd slowly bleed out until your blood pressure got so low you'd go into shock. All while this leather bloodhound used its OP sense of smell to track you no matter how far you crawled. That sense of smell is actually why women on their period are strongly advised to stay out of the Komodo's territory. Otherwise, you run the risk of getting stalked by this all-terrain land shark. Megalania went extinct about 40,000 years ago, and we can pretty much thank Divine Intervention for that. I almost forgot the fun part. Since Komodos have been known to dig out people's graves and eat the bodies inside, Megalania more than likely would have had a taste for humans. It's a salamander. Specifically, a giant Chinese salamander. The biggest ones can be over 100 pounds and max out at about 4 feet. The biggest one ever recorded was about 6 feet long. I'm not even 6 feet long unless I'm lying to somebody. In China, it's also sometimes called the baby fish. And that's because it can make a sound almost identical to that of a crying baby. They're not legal as pets, but even if they were, at best you'd get a lot of visits from CPS. And at worst, you might just get put on a list. And I low-key spent a minute trying to remember what this thing low-key reminded me of, until I remembered Hiccup trained his more melanated cousin. Also, me and this off-brand Pokemon have one thing in common, it's that we're both legally blind. But where I have contacts, giant salamanders have these little nodes all over their body that helps them sense vibrations around them. Basically, beasts breathing like Inosuke. And they usually do this while hunting for their worms, fish, crabs, and random shrew they like to eat. They'll also resort to cannibalism, but because they're blind, we'll never know if it's on purpose. Also, they can live to 60 years old, but there have been some stories of salamanders reaching 200. It's probably cat, but if it isn't, that means they were alive for slavery and chose to do nothing. 
Maybe that's why they're always crying. Let's talk about the fact that there was a special breed of jacked steroid lions living in Africa. Well, kinda. So there's a part of Africa where the Okavango River meets the Kalahari Desert, resulting in the oasis known as the Okavango Delta, which is basically a whole foods for animals of all kinds. Here's where the lions come in. Basically some years ago, a bunch of lions got stuck on an island when a river changed course and isolated them from the mainland. But instead of folding, the lions started adapting to survive there. Instead of avoiding the water, the lions would willingly wade and swim through the flooded wetlands. And they survived by hunting the only animal that was available at the time. Cape Buffalo. That is a Cape Buffalo. An assault charged with legs so on sight that hunters nicknamed it Black Death. And they're so dangerous that lions usually won't hunt them if they have another choice. These lions had no choice. So they became buffalo hunters. Instead of hunting at night like lions usually do, these lions would go grocery shopping during the day while the buffalo would stop to graze and drink. These lions would swim and hide in the waters at the right spot and then pretty much just jump them. And since buffalo can weigh well over a thousand pounds, the better they got at hunting them, the more the lions got to eat. All that extra protein meant these lions got swole. And lions are pretty jacked to begin with. The average male lion usually weighs anywhere from 300 to 500 pounds, while females are slightly smaller at like mid 200s to mid 300s. Well, according to researchers, the lionesses in the Okavango could flex nearly 400 pounds, while the males allegedly tapped out at well over 500. That is a big cat. At the time, some would even say the biggest cats in all of Africa. Sparknotes version, there were basically lions with seal training specialized in murking 1200 pound temper tantrums for a living. All while staying natty. That is the biggest animal you've never heard of. That is a talking. It's basically a giga goat that can tip the scales at up to and sometimes over 800 pounds. It might remind you of the muskox. Even though at a family reunion, the talking would sit right next to sheep. Their entire bodies are covered in an oil that smells a lot like burning rubber. They use that to mark their territory by rubbing up against something like a tree. It also helps protect them against the rain. If you've never seen one before, it's probably because they're only found in places in South Asia like Bhutan and parts of China. Also, they can live 12,000 feet above sea level. They use that big nose to heat up air before it gets into their lungs. It's also why it looks like a moose that lost a fight to a beehive. Which is actually how some biologists first described it. They're not usually dangerous to people, unless you give one a reason. In 2007, a talking broke into a man's house, hit stick him, and proceeded to injure eight more people, including a pregnant woman. That is a talking with a reason. But for the most part, they're pretty chill. The more you know. Yeah, a friendly reminder that wolves aren't just unhinged huskies. They are much, much, much bigger than you think. As big as you think they are, they will find a way to be bigger. This is a husky. This is a husky next to a wolf. And if you're talking about the biggest wolf in the world, you're probably talking about the timber wolf. Biggest ones can grow to 7 feet long. Keep in mind he's 7 feet tall. And they can weigh up to 130 some pounds. And if that number doesn't mean anything to you, keep in mind most German shepherds the same one that would probably fold most dogs, usually weigh less than 90. And if you're still not impressed, that is what happens when a wolf has to remind you who he is. You might be from the hood, but he from the wood, he don't play. Elephants have one huge fear, and it's actually being used to save their lives. And no, it's not what you think, it's not mice. Elephants are actually terrified of bees, they don't mess with them. It's kind of poetic, right? Something that weighs 5 million bees, is scared senseless by one. Mostly because they're afraid of getting stung inside their trunk. But anyway, elephants are smart enough to break into villages and steal food, which can get them put on a shirt by farmers protecting their livelihood. Alternatively, the elephants sometimes get their lick back by turning the farmers into chalk outlines. So to avoid all of this, farmers will put up fences with beehives around their property to keep the elephants out. And once again, the same animal that violates the biggest things in nature folds to a family of fly ops. And for the most part, it's worked. Farmers are able to keep the elephants out without losing their crops and without having to flatline an elephant. And the bees even produce honey, which is branded as elephant friendly. So yeah, being afraid of bees helps keep elephants and farmers on the census. There's your good news for the week. This horse shouldn't be alive right now. Let's talk about that. This is Shavalsky's horse. You can find them in Mongolia where there's about a little under 2,000 of them. It wasn't always like that, because this horse actually went extinct. This time 50 years ago, you would not find this horse in the wild. Shavalskis used to be all over Asia, but because of competition with humans, hunting, and habitat loss, they eventually got pushed out to East Asia, where they literally went to die. But, a few horses were kept in captivity after the species got discontinued in the wild. And by few, I mean 12. 
The same horse that used to be thousands strong got cut down to 12 members by 1950. I want y'all to think about how crazy that is. The 12 horses were carefully bred as part of a program that was pretty much their Hail Mary. Zoos that had Chevalskis even started an exchange program that way the next generation wouldn't be too inbred. In 1979, there were about 400 horses across 16 different breeding facilities and that number grew to 1500 by the 90s. Eventually the populations became stable enough to be reintroduced back into the Mongolian steppe, where every horse there now is directly descended from one of the last 12. They're still endangered, but you won't find a better comeback than that. This is not photoshopped, you're looking at the world's first and only albino gorilla. As a baby, he was found by a farmer after that same farmer murked his entire family. That's a whole anime origin. The white gorilla was sold to a primatologist and eventually ended up in the Barcelona Zoo, where the vanilla gorilla went viral. Or I guess the 60s version of viral, because that's when National Geographic put him on the cover in 1967. That's also around the time he got his name, Snowflake. Snowflake became a popular figure for both people visiting him in zoos and scientists that wanted to figure out just how he came out Caucasian. I should have put this earlier. Oh, whatever. Here it is. Hey, say hi, Daddy. Hi, Daddy. Who's goddamn white baby is that? Turns out it was because of a mutation. One so rare that in the 60 years since he was born, we have not found one gorilla like him. Snowflake ended up having 22 kids with three different mothers. Impressive, but still less rounds than Nick's cannon. And out of the 22, not one of them came out looking like Snowflake. He also had 22 grandchildren, none of them sharing the same Caucasian persuasion. He was literally one of one. He ended up getting skin cancer in 2001, which probably did have something to do with the albino thing. Not wanting to see him in pain, the zoo ended up putting him down. But not before thousands of people visited the zoo to say goodbye to him. He also managed to live to 40, even though he turned out to be inbred. His dad was his mom's uncle. Don't think about it too hard, it gets weird if you do. But overall, Snowflake did aight for himself. This pigeon saved hundreds of lives and might be the reason some of y'all exist. This is Sher Ami, and he was one of the hundreds of carrier pigeons used by the US Signal Corps during World War I. Carrier pigeons were popular at the time because radio wires weren't as reliable and pigeons can deliver messages at 50 miles per hour. During an intense battle in France, soldiers from the US 77th Division were pinned behind German lines. Over 500 men were trapped without food, water, or ammunition. While taking fire from the surrounding Germans, and even friendly fire from troops that didn't realize they were there. Out of over 500 men, more than 300 never made it out, and anyone who tried to go out for help was quickly put out of commission by the German soldiers. They had no choice but to send out carrier pigeons asking for help, but the Germans knew about this, and they were trained to murk anything with feathers out of the sky. That's when they sent out Sher Ami, with a note attached to his leg begging for help and for the Allies to stop firing. Sher Ami flew to deliver the message, but got lit up by German gunmen. Against every force of nature, he ate the shells and traveled the full 25 miles over to division headquarters. Despite being blinded, bleeding, and having his leg literally hang on by a thread. The message was received and about 194 men survived because of it. And so did he, after army medics refused to let the bird pass tents. He lost his leg, but not his life, and the one-legged hero of the 77th Infantry was sent home on a boat back to the US, where he received several awards for what he did, including the Croix de Guerre, one of the highest military honors in France. He passed away about 8 months after his injury, but you can still see him in the Smithsonian. Just know you're looking at a hero.